Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Deb Hackathorn, Principal with Civic Point Government Affairs, which is a subsidiary of Frost Brown Todd. I'm also very proud to be the Vice Chair of the CMC Board of Trustees. I'm pleased that you are all with us today for the forum. Thank you to today's forum partner, the League of Women Voters of Metropolitan Columbus, and to the Grange Insurance Audubon Center for hosting us. We're also grateful to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream, which is being carried on CMC's social media platforms as well. Let's thank all of those who are supporting today's forum. And now for this week's community conversation. On August the 8th, Ohio voters will be asked to go to the polls to decide whether it should be more difficult to amend the state constitution. Currently, Ohio citizens can initiate a change to the Ohio Constitution, and that would require the approval of a simple majority of voters. If issue one passes, that will raise it to 60% of voters needed to pass this type of constitutional amendment. The change has enormous implications down the road for Ohio voters to decide what goes in and what stays out of the Constitution. We look forward to today's conversation on the pros and cons of this proposed change. And now it is my great honor to welcome today's speakers. First to my left is Mike Curtin, Associate Publisher Emeritus with the Columbus Dispatch, former state representative from the 17th District in the Ohio House of Representatives, and he will be presenting the uh, no side or the opposition for issue one. Uh, farther down left is State Senator Rob McCauley. He's from the Ohio Senate District 1, which is in the far northwest portion of the state. He's also the current Senate Majority Floor Leader, and he will be presenting the proponents for Issue 1. And finally, please welcome our esteemed host, Rodney Dunnigan, Assistant News Director with ABC6 and Fox 28 to help moderate today's discussion. You can read more about all of our speaker in the forum flyer. Rodney, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, Columbus Metropolitan Club uh, inviting me in to moderate this event. Trust me, uh, I think this will be a lively afternoon. Uh, I just talked to the fellas outside, so I'm definitely uh, looking forward to a uh, lively yet peaceful uh, debate. Uh, Deb kind of broke down, uh, you know, the uh, points of this uh, debate to speak so today. So I guess uh, we'll just start uh, right with you, uh, Mike, from the get-go. Your issues with this uh, possible change of the amendment. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you for all, all of you being here. Uh, the problem alleged by Senator McCauley and others to justify their proposed amendment does not exist. It's entirely made up. It's a phantom. It's Sasquatch. It's the boogeyman. In his sponsor testimony in the House and the Senate, Senator McCauley testified, quote, over the years, Ohio's Constitution has been easily influenced by outside groups and special interests seeking to alter our Constitution for their own benefit. We have witnessed time and time again as special interests buy their way onto the statewide ballot only to spend millions of dollars drowning the airwaves seeking to secure permanent fundamental changes to our state by a vote margin of 50% plus one, close quote. The claim, our state constitution has been easily influenced by special interests time and time again is not true. It's not even close. As Casey Stengel famously said, you could look it up. Let's go to the record book. That book is kept by Dave Yost, the Ohio Attorney General. The Attorney General's Office is the mandatory first step for anyone, special interest or not, seeking to go to the streets to collect signatures for a proposed amendment. If you go to Dave Yost's AG website, I encourage you to do that, and click on the tab Ballot Initiative and Referendum, you can read the record book for yourselves. You'll find that in the last 15 years, from 2007 through 2022, 51 separate organizations have filed 88 summaries of proposed amendments, seeking permission to hit the streets to collect signatures. 
The reason for 88 summaries from 51 groups is because the Attorney General frequently rejects proposed summaries as incomplete, which requires resubmissions. Of the 51 distinct organizations that began the process of seeking to amend our Constitution, how many actually made it to the ballot? How many were able to actually circulate those petitions, meet the tremendously difficult quotas for gathering signatures from 44 of our 88 counties, and then win a spot on the statewide ballot? Well, the record book will tell you, over those 15 years, of those 51 separate groups, six were successful in placing proposed amendments on the ballot. Six. Of those six, three won and three lost. Of the three that won, Senator McCauley and his party supported two of those three. The two were the so-called Freedom to Choose Health Care Amendment in 2011 and the Rights for Crime Victims Amendment in 2017. Three wins in 51 attempts for a batting average of 6%. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a record of our Ohio Constitution being, quote, easily influenced by outside groups and special interests, nor is it a record of, quote, time and time again. And if we look back not just over the past 15 years, but over the entire 111 years in which Ohio citizens have had the right of the initiative, we find that they've approved 19 of 71 proposed amendments, just over one-fourth. Ohioans have used their initiative rights responsibly, very responsibly. And lastly, of the 19 amendments they've approved, Senator McCauley and his allies have identified only one, one of 19 that they take exception to. And that was a casino amendment of 2009. They haven't identified one of the other 18. I'd like to hear them identify one of the other 18, then we can talk about it. And, and I would like to discuss the casino amendment of 09 as well, because there are some very important lessons to be learned from that <clears throat> issue. The one lesson the record book undeniably shows, Ohio's citizens have been responsible. No one should be making up a story to justify the attempted abolition of majority rule on a constitutional right Ohioans have used responsibly for 111 years. Thank you, Robbie. Rob, your response? <clears throat> so thank you for the opportunity to be here with all of you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to join my former colleague from the Ohio House, represent, former Representative Curtin. Um, when we look at this amendment, um, it's, it's, it's appropriate, I think, to look at it in the, in, to look at it in the, in the uh, uh, proper context. And when we're looking at the proper role, if you will, of a constitution as it relates to the Ohio Revised Code, all of us at some point or another have probably taken a high school civics class or, or otherwise to know that the Constitution should be treated as superior to the Ohio Revised Code. And indeed, that's reflected in the vast majority of states. Um, in fact, that's reflected in uh, over 80 percent of the states in the country is that there's uh, superior thresholds to amend the Constitution than there are the statutes if they even allow uh, for that to be on the ballot um, at all. In fact, when you look at the states across the country, there are only approximately 18 states that allow for voter-initiated constitutional amendments. We're not removing the voters from initiating constitutional amendments. Of those, only nine states allow for a simple majority to amend those constitutions across the board for all questions. And of those nine states, there are only six states, including Ohio, that have a 50% simple majority to amend not only the Constitution, but the statutes of the state of Ohio. Thing that goes often, uh, often unreported is the fact that we have a statutory initiative process as well, a statutory initiative process that also requires a 50% simple majority in order to pass something into the Ohio Revised Code. You don't hear about it all that often because there aren't that many people using it. And there aren't that many people using it because of the fact that if you have a 50% plus one majority to get something into the Constitution, and you have a 50% plus one majority to get something into the statute, 
and you know the Constitution is going to enjoy more protections than the statue, why spend the money to put it into the statue? Now, I'm not here to suggest that we shouldn't be looking at the statutory process as well. I've been public in saying that we should. But I also think that everybody should be able to acknowledge that the protections afforded there for our Constitution should be at a greater level and a greater threshold than that which it would take to enact a statute in the state of Ohio. That's why, as I mentioned before, the vast majority of states don't even allow for this to happen. And we are on one of only six states that would allow 50% simple majority for both a statutory initiative and for a constitutional initiative. Now, when I look at the history of how this has happened, I would say we would all, I'm sure, agree that money in politics has gotten uh, much more prevalent than it ever has, even when, when, uh, when the rest of it, when all of us were growing up. There's a lot more money flowing around for these issues. And I think uh, even though the representative, former Representative Curtin uh, had mentioned that the casino amendment shouldn't be brought up as a bad example, the casino amendment should absolutely be brought up as a bad example for why this process could be dangerous for the state of Ohio as it's currently crafted. And let me tell you why. It passed with about 53% of the vote, certainly obviously getting over the simple majority. But many people don't realize the casino amendment actually has the real estate parcel numbers of the uh, pieces of real estate on which the uh, casinos could be constructed in Ohio. We put real estate parcel numbers in our constitution. Oh, by the way, the people who funded that amendment had already bought those pieces of real estate prior to putting the question on the ballot, thereby inscribing for themselves a sweetheart deal at best for Ohioans, but arguably a monopoly as well for themselves, which is something that we need to guard against. We have guarded against it uh, in uh, subsequent constitutional amendments where we've said you can't have a monopoly uh, unless it gets approved in two separate elections. But there's still an opportunity for people to do that. There's still an opportunity for people to get sweetheart deals for themselves in the constitutions. A short time later, the recreational marijuana amendment was brought up, whereby they tried to use the same playbook. And but for some grassroots effort to really tamp down that effort, the initial polling was suggesting that that was going to pass. That too had specific parcels of real estate mentioned in the constitutional amendment that the wealthy out-of-state investors had, had already bought up before they put the question on the ballot. These are the types of abuses that we need to guard against in a form of good government. Both of those things should have been something that should have been left to the Ohio Revised Code instead of being in the Constitution where unforeseen consequences could not have been dealt with after the fact. Now, going forward to uh, the basic premise of why 60 percent, why the vast majority of states require an elevated threshold if they require, if they allow the threshold at all. And it goes back as well, and we can be instructive, although I'm not saying we should be exactly like the United States Constitution. We can look to the United States Constitution as instructive in this, in this fashion, looking at the fact that our United States Constitution requires two-thirds vote of both chambers to even put a question to the states. It then requires 75 percent of state legislatures to ratify an amendment to the Constitution. Alternatively, you can have an Article V convention where 34, two-thirds of the states, or over two-thirds, it's got to be over two-third mark of the states, uh, put, call for an Article V convention and then 38 of those states, 75 percent plus uh, whichever one state to get over the threshold are the ones who actually have to ratify those changes. The reasoning for that, obviously, is because the founders understood the danger of faction. And you can look at the Federalist Papers, Madison's 10th uh, uh, letter, where he st talks about the danger of faction to a form of republic government, where if we allow a small minority to impose their will on a otherwise large, min or a small majority to impose their will on an otherwise large minority, you're going to create faction and divisiveness. That's what our republic elected government is for is to deal with those issues that are the policy issues of the day. Our Constitution is an overriding uh, document that is instructive on how we're supposed to manage our, our government and what rights that our citizens will enjoy. And as a result, it deserves that elevated protection. It also needs to be something that is widely accepted and widely supported 
to avoid the danger of faction that we're seeing happen across our country all too much right now. Uh, Mike, I want to bring this question up to you. You brought up uh, special interests. We have a room full of uh, you know, voters in here who want to be informed about what's going on. And, and Rob and his counterparts are, are pushing the fact that what they're trying to do are protect the voters, protect these folks uh, here in this room. What would you say to that, and why do you disagree with that? The biggest talking point used by Rob and the other supporters for this issue is that we're trying to protect our Constitution from special interests, especially out-of-state special interests, from buying their way into our state constitution. <clears throat> Those were the exact same talking points used in South Dakota last year. Those are the same exact talking points used by the proponents in Arkansas last year. South Dakota beat this thing 67-33. Arkansas beat it 59-41 because the voters in those two states saw through the speciousness of that argument. <clears throat> there are special interests who are bankrolling these things in state after state after state because they find it much more easy to find pliability in state legislatures than they do among the people at large. They want to take away your right, our right, to hold them accountable. The reason the 1912 State Constitutional Convention was the crown jewel in Ohio's experiment with democracy is because we had one of the most corrupt state houses in the nation. And again today, as the FBI has demonstrated, we're coming off having one of the most corrupt state houses in the nation again. And the great reformers from both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party in the late 1800s and 1900s teamed up to say we need reform. So the Ohio Progressive Republican League, the Ohio Progressive Democratic League uh, made book with each other to go in and clean up that state house. That was the driving force between the uh, D's and R's to uh, have that convention uh, they entertained 400 different proposals, ended up with 42. The voters approved 34 of them. The crown jewel was the initiative and referendum. Teddy Roosevelt came and gave the best speech at that convention and said, if you want to have a fighting chance to control these guys at the State House now and forever, you better have the initiative and referendum. And Ohioans approved the initiative and referendum by a landslide vote. What was that landslide vote? 57.5 percent, 15 points. 57.5 to 42.5, Rob, is a landslide in anybody's book. 60 is far, far away. It's meant to kneecap the initiative process altogether. The special interests are bankrolling their campaign. You may have read about the biggest bankroller so far, Richard Uline of Illinois, who inherited the Schlitz Brewing Empire fortune. A uh, guy wasn't born on third base. He was born in the highest floor in the penthouse. And uh, he and buddies of his, like the Koch brothers, are bankrolling these efforts because they find state legislatures easier to deal with than the people at large. Uh, the special interests are all over this thing. Uh, R Richard Uline has already contributed more than a million dollars to their campaign. How dare they talk about special interests? It offends me. Now, there may be some special interest money on both sides. The stakes in this race are very, very big. This is the biggest constitutional proposal in 110 years. Uh, we gotta take it very seriously, and it's the height of bad faith to create an August special election to try to sneak this thing by. So I wanna talk about special interests. I also wanna talk about casinos. Uh, Senator McCauley mistakenly said, I don't wanna talk about casinos. I do wanna talk about casinos, Rodney, if you'll allow us to, because um, that teaches some very special uh, lessons about what should and should not be in the Constitution and how they get there. Uh, Rob, I, I want to ask you a question because Mike touched on something and I think um, you, know, you would want to respond to this. He said this is a move to basically take away the rights of the voters, the people in this room, to hold you and your counterparts accountable. What, what would you say to that? I don't think that's the case at all. I think when you, when you look at the rights that we enjoy at the most basic fundamental level in this country, they're guaranteed in the United States Constitution. Those rights at the same level are guaranteed in our state's Constitution. And so when, when, you look at, when you look at what this bill actually does, all right, we're not taking away people's right to vote. We're not taking away anybody's rights under this bill. What we are doing, I would argue, is protecting the existing rights that are in the Constitution from somebody who may come in and say, I don't like the fact and I know this will get a lot of different uh, reaction depending on the room you're in. I don't like the fact that you can defend yourself in your own home with a firearm. 
So I'm going to go and I'm going to introduce an amendment to try and change that, which would arguably be federally unconstitutional, but somebody could come in and do that. Or I don't like the fact that um, you enjoy this right or that right that's guaranteed under your constitution. Or in the case that we've seen with some of these things, I don't like the fact that the legislature won't allow me to operate a casino in this state. Or I don't like the fact that the legislature won't pass a bill allowing recreational marijuana in this state. Where in the Constitution should anybody have a constitutional right to smoke marijuana? That's what the types of amendments that we're seeing are coming in. And so in many ways, it's protecting our Constitution from a variety of things, not just protecting the rights, but also it's something it's worth pointing out. This only recently has become a partisan issue. When you look back in the history of the last 10 years or so since the casino amendment, there have been a variety of topics, there have been a variety of editorials, uh, by, by media and others, and even bipartisan efforts to discuss the topic of raising the threshold to amend the Constitution above 50 percent. The Ohio Constitutional Modernization Commission had a committee that was tasked with, view, with uh, reviewing this exact concept, uh, where should we raise the threshold or not. Their committee report that was approved by a partisan majority said that the threshold should be raised to at least 55%. That never got a vote of the whole Constitutional Modernization Commission, but that was a bipartisan commission. Indeed, in 2018, uh, Democrat State Representative Glenn Holmes introduced a resolution himself to raise the threshold to 60% uh, to amend our Constitution. So this is something that only just recently has turned into a partisan issue. Um, and I think over the course of time, people have broadly recognized that having it at a 50% threshold allows for some potentially unintended consequences um, to occur in our Constitution that would be hard to unravel. Um, Mike, I want you to respond. You had um, kind of a difference of opinion to something Rob just said. Kind of tell us what you thought. Well, several. Uh, to his credit, Rob has raised about eight or ten issues already, uh, and I'd like to get into as many as we can. But two factual errors, and again, I'm going to give you the record book so you can look it up for yourself to see who's right and who's wrong. Uh, he said the Ohio Constitutional Modernization Commission, a committee of that commission, which I served on, recommended a threshold of at least 55%. False. It did not. It did recommend that the full commission, the 32-member commission, consider a threshold of 55% flat, not at least 55% flat, in exchange for reform of the statutory initiative, which Rob is right, has been seldom used. Ohioans voted the right of the statutory initiative and the constitutional initiative to themselves in 1912. They've almost never used the statutory initiative. Why? Because you can go to the time and trouble of getting the voters to approve a statutory initiative, amend the Ohio Revised Code, and the next day the General Assembly could wipe it out. There's no protection in it. Many states that offer their citizens the statutory initiative have a safe harbor provision in their constitutions saying that if the citizens adopt an initiated statute, the legislature cannot touch it for a period of five years, seven years, whatever, absent a supermajority vote. That protection is not in the Ohio Constitution. It's why it's seldom used. It's been used three times in 111 years. In 2006, for the Clean Air Amendment for our indoor spaces, in 1949, to allow manufacturers of oleomargarine to, cover, to color their product yellow to resemble butter, and in 1933, to create an old age pension system. Three times in 111 years, that's why we don't have people using the initiative statute, and the General Assembly refuses to look at it, refuses to look at it. They want to have their cake and eat it too, not reform the initiated statute, and make the initiated constitutional process a lot harder than it is, not only by a 60% threshold, but by an 88 county signature requirement, which I hope we can talk about. The other inaccuracy that Rob put out there that needs to be corrected, among others, is Ohio is one of only three states, uh, I'm sorry, there are only three states out there that require a supermajority vote for amend amending their constitutions. Colorado's at 55. Illinois is at 60, Florida is at 60. And if you want to check either one of us on that, the book is the Book of States. It's online, it's published by the Council of State Governments. It's free, and chapter one is written by Professor John Dinan of Wake Forest University. 
Chapter one is on state constitutionalism. It compares and contrasts all 50 state constitutions, including their initiative process. It has charts showing what the thresholds are, showing what the passage rates are. John Dinan is the god of reporting state constitutionalism. He's the guy whose word you should take, not mine, not Rob's. Check the record book. Um, I don't want to filibuster the whole morning, the, the afternoon, Rodney, although we could, uh, but, but please check for yourself. Fact checking on this is incredibly important, and we have to do that between now and August 8th. Well, this is a question I want to ask to both of you, and, and Rob, I will start with you first. Uh, at least from a media standpoint, from what we've been covering and a lot of people that we have been talking to, they believe that this uh, entire issue kind of boils down to abortion rights. And, and I want to get your comments, uh, both of you all, on that. What do you think about that, Rob? I'll start with you. So I'd, I'd like to point something out. When I made my remarks regarding the state thresholds, I pointed out that nine of those states have some form of elevated threshold. And it's not just some of them may say that it's 50% threshold, but it, there's an elevated threshold in that you have to have so many people vote in the election. You have to have you know, various different thresholds that aren't just a basic 50% simple majority. Um, and there are a variety of states that have different thresholds for different questions. And so um, while he may be correct on a basic 50% question, the nine of those states have elevated thresholds in some fashion or another unrelated to the 50% question. I have the states in front of me right here that we, that we approve. But I, you know, we don't need to belabor um, that point. Um, regarding, and I, as I talked about before, I think we are, we're going to have to disagree on the point that I think the reason that people seldom use statutory initiatives is because they're the same threshold for both. And um, with, with that in mind, why would, you, why would you go through the hassle of a statutory initiative? I've publicly stated this is, this is Rob McCulley's opinion, it's not the opinion of anybody in my chamber and certainly not in the House, um, that we need to take a look at the statutory initiative process and see how it can work better. Um, so I'm, I, I'm willing to agree on that at least um, because I think that would be more appropriate to use with most of these questions um, than the Constitution. Regarding the ab abortion question, I know this has been conflated with the issue. And I certainly understand that the timing um, uh, uh, has, has created that, that conflation. But as I stated to you outside when we, when we, were, on the, uh, uh, when we were talking on camera, um, this is an issue that in order to get something on the ballot as the legislature, you need 60 percent um, in, uh, in both chambers to be able to put a question on the ballot. Um, it's a threshold that is difficult to meet. It's a threshold that requires a lot of coalition building to even get it on the ballot. As I pointed out earlier, this has been a bipartisan discussion that's gone on at the State House for the last 10 years, and we weren't able to get the coalition built until just now. For most of us, this isn't just about abortion. For most, and I think you can look at the people who are behind this type of campaign. You can look at the NFIB, which is the largest small business organization in the state, you, you can look at the National Restaurant Association, which by and large represents small business owners. You can look at the Ohio Farm Bureau, which represents farmers across the state. Um, you can look at the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, which represents small and large businesses alike. They don't have anything to say about abortion. They would prefer not to touch the issue. Yet they look at this as an important enough change to make to our Constitution that they've decided to back it. And they're not going to be a part of any campaign, I can, I can virtually assure you of that, that addresses the abortion issue because it's not their issue. Their issues, however, are going to be impacted by this and they see the value in having a, our governing document um, enjoy uh, greater protections than it has right now in order, to make sure that, um, in order to make sure that there's consistency in the state for people to run their businesses and run their farms and raise their families. The August special election needs some discussion. Uh, there are many, many unprecedented um, things about this proposal. Uh, the most galling uh, is scheduling this for an August special election after they just voted last December to abolish all special elections in every case except for certified fiscal emergencies. The it's first, it's important to note that no General Assembly in Ohio history has attempted to roll back the constitutional authority of Ohio voters. So that's one. No General Assembly has ever tried to roll back our constitutional powers. 
And second, no General Assembly has created an August special election specifically designed to minimize voter turnout on such a fundamental right. All previous General Assemblies, 134 of them across 220 years of statehood, and if you're doing the math, why 134 General Assemblies in 220 years? Because the first 50 years of our statehood, we had annual, not biennial, General Assemblies because state rep terms were one year. Talk about keeping politicians on a tight leash. They did. <laughs> All previous General Assemblies had the good judgment, the respect for Ohio voters, and yes, the good faith to reserve fundamental questions of governance for regular elections, and usually November elections. Ohio has a longstanding tradition of seeking maximum voter participation for the most important questions facing us. That's exactly what Frank LaRose said he wanted to do last December before some folks persuaded him to change his mind. This is the most important proposed constitutional change in 111 years, and the honorable tradition, respected by all of their predecessors up until today, of seeking maximum voter participation on the most important issues facing us now is being tossed aside. It's being thrown in the trash can. This should sadden us. It should anger us. I'm trying to hold my anger up here, Rodney, in case you noticed. Because it's cynical. None of us should approve cynicism. And this is cynical. It is a historic display of bad faith. The General Assembly voted to eliminate August elections. Now they're bringing them back. Secretary of State Frank LaRose said August special elections should be eliminated. This was his testimony last year because, quote, just a handful of voters end up making big decisions. This isn't how democracy is supposed to work, close quote. He was correct then. This is not how democracy is supposed to work. Uh, Rob, I'm gonna let you respond in one second, but uh, we'll move questions uh, after you respond to our uh, live stream and in-person uh, audiences in just a few. If you have a question, please make your way to the microphone. And if you're watching online, please type all your questions in the chat before we take those audience questions. Again, I do have uh, one more question for Rob. Uh, Mike kind of touched on this. He called this a historic display of bad faith. What would you say to that? So to, to address the, the House Bill 458, which was the, the bill that dealt with special elections, um, the Supreme Court, independent of the, 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 the question of the August or not, the Supreme Court just upheld this past week based on a 1967 Ohio Supreme Court case, Foreman versus Brown, where this very similar question was in front of the court, that the Constitution states by its operation uh, that the General Assembly, when putting constitutional questions on the ballot, can set the date of a special election. So, but why August? So August, again, I go back to my original point. This has been something that we have been trying to do in discussing on a bipartisan uh, uh, fashion for the last 10 plus years coalition building to get to 60% on an issue especially like this is difficult. The only way that we were going to be able to get it on the ballot, um, and we view it as an important question for all issues, um, the only way we were going to be able to get it on the ballot was the way that we did. And so for all issues, again, and I point to the support that it has from groups that have nothing to do and don't wish to even touch the issue of abortion. Um, it's all about the coalition and how you get to the vote total. All right, thank you both. As you know, it is CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. Sophia Fifner with CMC is curating questions from today's live stream audience. Uh, for those of you with us in person, please join Sophia at the microphone if you have questions. Now, out of respect for others, please keep your questions brief and to the point so that we can get in as many as possible. Uh, we don't want to uh, basically keep going and going. We don't want a speech, just a question. So remember that. Uh, end it with a question mark. Uh, Sophia, what's that first question? Thank you so much. So this question is from Ju Fang Lang. The underlying reason for the special election, which intends to make it harder for constitutional amendments, will only increase polarization in our political system. And this isn't going to change without fundamental change in of the political incentives. Ranked choice voting has proven records on toning down partisan rhetoric and making politics more issues focused. 
to both of our part panelists, what is your opinion about ranked choice voting? Uh, ranked choice voting uh, takes some learning. People have to get up the learning curve. Uh, it's not been used uh, too much. Um, it is used in Alaska. It's used in a few other states and localities, more localities than states. Uh, but it essentially is intended to not have a win-lose right out of the gate, but to give people a second choice, a third choice in some cases, and then have a runoff. And it's meant to have a moderating effect on the type of um, uh, people who eventually get elected to, to encourage compromise. But uh, the truth of the matter is, since last November 17th, nine days after the election, when Senator LaRose got up and said, we have this burning platform, burning fire issue we need to solve after not mentioning a thing about it for a year worth of campaigning for re-election to Secretary of State, I've been rather mono-focused on this issue. I haven't really studied uh, ranked choice voting I promise I will, but not until after August 8th. Uh, I only know uh, what I know about ranked choice voting based upon what I've read in news articles. Um, I think the description that uh, former Representative Curtin has given is, is pretty accurate, uh, but I don't really have an opinion on it right now. I think it's too early to, to delve into that issue. My name is Kathy Fox. Um, my question has to do with the senator's claim that there's bipartisan support for, in favor of issue one. Um, I've seen that Republican former governors Bob Taft and John Kasich are against this issue, and former Republican attorneys general Betty Montgomery and Jim Petro are against the issue. Uh, it seems like there are some pretty heavy, well-informed Republicans who are not in favor. What is your, both of your responses to that? For the question, to clarify, I didn't say necessarily that there was bipartisan support for issue one. I think we'll find that out certainly on election day. My, my point was that the, the general concept of raising the threshold above 50% has been a bipartisanly supported discussion over the last 10 years historically. The, the, the four former governors and five former attorney generals, five from one party, four from the other, coming out to denounce a proposed amendment placed on the ballot by the General Assembly is unprecedented. As I said earlier, there's a lot of unprecedented things about this issue. That's one of them. We don't see governors and former attorney generals come out of the weeds, come out of their retirement homes, come out of where they are to denounce proposed amendments they have on this one. Why? because they're appalled at the cynicism as well of the proposal and the timing of it. Those nine former uh, governors and attorney generals have a combined experience of 77 years in statewide executive office. They do have some perspective. Janice Katz. <clears throat> Gentlemen, I believe that today is the anniversary of the ratification of the United States Constitution which enshrined uh, the need for voting to tell our legislators what we want them to do or how they are supposed to vote. And my concern, and I, I hope that you can answer it, is with the way the laws for districts have been drawn um, and in the Constitution and the kind of legislation coming out, if this is changed to make it so much more difficult for the people to say what they want. How are we to have a democracy? How can we represent, how can we represent ourselves or our thoughts if our districts are designed to keep us from voting the, to, for people we want because we can't win? Or once it's in the legislature, if we get the statute uh, we go for the statute to change the statute. That's changed by the legislature. And now we can't have, make it much more difficult to put something on uh, the Constitution to protect rights. Thank you. So uh, with, with, with that question regarding redistricting, um, I think as the Supreme Court even pointed out in its jurisprudence of the redistricting decisions, uh, the, the concept of redistricting in Ohio 
given the way that uh, our, our Constitution is set up, is, is a pretty nuanced conversation in many respects. We can argue over where the numbers should be, but given the restrictions in there regarding splitting and, and things of the other nature, it's a nuanced conversation probably for best reserved for, a, for another day. Um, but as it concerns um, the, the voter involvement, um, I, I think when you look at the history of Ohioans voting in the, uh, and the historic election results in the state of Ohio, I think you, people have to uh, look at Ohio, and I think many national uh, pundits have phased it this way as well, as a, as a center-right state, the way things are right now. Um, you look at the gubernatorial elections dating back to the early 90s, um, and all statewide elections of statewide elected officers dating back to the 90s, um, and only one of them in 2006 resulted in Republicans losing statewide elected offices. Um, certainly we've had presidential elections that have gone the other way, uh, United States Senate elections that have gone the other way, um, but I think when you look at the, the administration of state government, Ohioans over the last 30 years have overwhelmingly decided that this is a center-right state. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't confuse that with, uh, uh, or I would disagree rather, that that somehow is, uh, is uh, removing Ohioans from the ability to participate in their government. I think Ohio's election system, the way that we conduct elections, the, the fact that you can vote 28 days early and, and everything else that we enjoy in this state are pretty robust when compared to the rest of the country. Janice, your question uh, raises the question of, of federalism, and Senator McCauley talked about federalism. In fact, he quoted James Madison in his comments about federalism, so I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, broaden the my answer a bit to, to address your concern and Senator McCauley's comments. Uh, the proponents of this issue repeatedly say that the Ohio Constitution should have the same stability, should be nearly as hard to amend as the U.S. Constitution. They, they're continually comparing the U.S. Constitution to state constitutions. This misunderstands federalism. It completely misunderstands what the nation's founders intended, including Madison. In Federalist 45, Madison wrote, the powers delegated to the proposed U.S. Constitution to the federal government are few and defined, few and defined. Those which are to remain with the states will be numerous and indefinite, few and defined in the U.S. Constitution, numerous and indefinite in state governments. Why? Because they wanted to leave the details to the states. That's why the U.S. Constitution says nothing on education. It says nothing on state finance, debts, or taxation. It says nothing on state judiciaries. It says nothing on cities, counties, or townships. It says nothing on civil service. It says nothing on dozens and dozens and dozens of other state responsibilities. State constitutions must address all these functions. They must specifically define and limit governmental powers, cities, counties, townships, on and on and on, school districts. And because times change, and citizen expectations change with the times, state constitutions must be able to adapt to those changing expectations, those changing times. State constitutions must be living documents. They must be easier to amend than the U.S. Constitution. A uh, good example is in uh, 1959, the General Assembly had to put an amendment on the ballot to allow voters to authorize municipalities to expand water and sewer service beyond their municipal boundaries. We'd become a suburban nation, an exurban nation, the automobile nation, and that 1912 Home Rule Amendment limited how far cities could extend all utility services. The Constitution had to be a living document so that people could go back, amend it, and allow our, our municipal water and sewer systems to serve regions, not just their small municipalities. The Columbus water and sewer system serves 33 different jurisdictions now. Thank God, if they didn't, a lot of people wouldn't have lived. Quick. Um, I don't believe, and so I would, I would disagree with the comments that we're saying that this should be at the same level or enjoy the exact same protection of the federal constitution. I think the federal constitution and the way it was set up relative to statutes has been instructive in many ways of what we should consider when forming our own constitutions. Indeed, we enjoy similar government structure to the federal government, et cetera. But at the same time, it's also not an argument necessarily, even if you are looking at uh, Madison's 40, uh, Madison 45, and uh, that we should be down at 50%, particularly when we enjoy a statutory initiative process. 
let me go back to my original comments. We are in the vast, uh, my, we are in the vast minority of states that allow both a 50% plus one constitutional amendment process and a 50% plus one statutory initiative process, six by my count, that allow both of those things. Most other states, the vast majority of states, have seen it fit to either to have uh, no ability for this to be put on the ballot, which we are not in favor of eliminating, um, or they have seen it fit to have an elevated threshold. Um, so with all of that in mind, um, I would disagree that we're characterizing this, that this needs to be identical to the federal government, but I would say that there's strong argument um, that it should be higher than 50 percent. That, that amendment in 1959 passed with 57 percent of the vote, like lots and lots and lots of amendments. Cleve Ricksecker, I'm going to ask the, the, the question asked by the prior speaker again. What would be the cumulative impact of the current level of gerrymandering plus passage of this constitutional amendment? To, to, to the question, again, redistricting is a much more nuanced conversation than we probably have time to address today. Um, I would say that there, the, the opinion on whether or not Ohio um, is gerrymandered, and if it is, to what extent, um, is, is something that reasonable minds are going to differ on. I think if you look at the Supreme Court decisions that have come out, um, indeed, if you look at the Supreme Court decisions that are even coming out um, from the United States Supreme Court, um, we have to acknowledge that uh, one thing they teach you in law school is reasonable minds can differ, and I don't believe that it's gerrymandered at all, or even to the extent that it's being alleged to have been gerrymandered by many people out there. My name is Wilson Browning. Um, many of the headlines about the issue uh, pertain to the 60% threshold, and much of this discussion today has been the same. Um, something that was helpful for me to inform how I think about this issue was learning about uh, the pieces of it that affect the signature collection process. Would, would both of you um, just comment on those changes and, and how you believe about them? Back in, uh, back in uh, November, when, Senator, when Secretary of State LaRose introduced this, he was asked by the State House Press Corps, uh, would you support an expanded signature requirement? He said at that time, no, I would not. That would only empower the special interests. That's another one he flipped on. But uh, directly in answer to your question, Ohio's signature gathering quotas already are among the toughest in the nation. State issue one would make Ohio unquestionably the toughest in the nation. And again, go to John Dinan's chapter one uh, in the Book of States, Council of State Governments, and you can read this for yourself. Among the 18 states that provide their citizens with the constitutional initiative process, only three states have geographic distribution requirements tied to counties. Most tie them to congressional districts or state legislative districts, not counties. Since 1912, Ohio has had a 44-county quota requiring signatures from registered voters equaling at least 5% of the total vote in the last election for governor from those counties. And statewide, as you know, a 10% threshold must be met, requiring these groups to gather uh, 413,000 valid signatures, which requires them to gather 600, 700, 800,000 to make sure that they meet the, the 413,000 threshold. Ohio's 44 county requirement is an enormous barrier and is a major reason that I said at the outset only six citizen initiated amendments have qualified for the ballot in the past 15 years. State issue one would expand the 5% quota from 44 to all 88 counties. No other state requires signature quotas from all of its counties. Let me give you one example. I don't want to pick on Vinton County, but it's the smallest county in the state with fewer than 13,000 residents. One one thousandth of Ohio's population of 11.8 million with a campaign to just say no to a petition drive in Vinton County or with the ability to find a friendly common place judge who finds problems with the initiative petition filed at the Vinton County Board of Elections. One county representing one one thousandth of the population of Ohio would be able to veto what 99.99% of Ohioans in of the other 87 counties would like a chance to vote on. Let's not pick on Vinton County. Ohio has 26 counties with less than 40,000 residents, so pick one. 
you could pick any county among those 26, that county with uh, three-tenths of 1% of the population or less would have effective veto authority over the other 87 counties. And believe me, if an 88-county signature requirement is put in place at some point, opponents will use just that strategy to just say no in a few small counties or, God forbid, find a friendly common pleas judge who can uh, help you disable, derail an initiative in that county and the whole thing's dead. That's why that's a bridge too far. I, I think when, when looking at the, the reason the change has been in there, I think in, in some ways indirectly, um, former Representative Curtin's comments highlight the reason for it in that there is a minimalization of many other parts of the state and their role as Ohioans as well in how our government operates. And we dealt with similar comments on the floor of the Senate that implied that the judiciary somehow wouldn't be able to, to, be, to have the integrity to deal with some of these issues um, on a variety of topics that usually come from our um, senators from urban areas. Um, and, and, and frankly, that to me is discouraging. It's discouraging for a variety of reasons, and frankly, let me give you a reason why. I'm an attorney. I've practiced in courts across Northwest Ohio, primarily in rural areas. Those judges are just as qualified and have just as much integrity of judges everywhere else, including, I would say, my mother, who you might be surprised to learn, is a Democrat in Henry County. And she's one of the greatest uh, uh, legal minds as far as domestic relations is concerned in this entire state. So the supposition that somehow these judges and these people in these counties are crooked is a ridiculous supposition on its face. But it's also looking at um, the, other, the other comments I made. The danger of being able to, uh, to uh, of, of certain people or, or a small majority being able to strong arm the rest of the state. That's the reason we put this in place, is to make sure that something has a wide, broad-ranging support across the state of Ohio, and indeed, it's 5% of every county. So for a county of 14,000 people, the registered electorate in that county, I'm sure, is probably uh, six to 7,000 people, if I had to guess, maybe even less than that. It's 5% of that number. It's 5% of that number that you would have to find. The question of uh, signature requirements like, like the 88 county one or others uh, raises a one person, one vote issue. Last year, the Michigan Supreme Court tossed out Michigan's geographical based signature requirements as a violation of one person, one vote. In Ohio, in 1977, the Ohio Constitutional Revision Commission that met from 1970 to 1977, the predecessor of the Constitutional Modernization Commission, which did great work, recommended Ohio abolish its 44 a county signature requirement because it could be a violation of one person, one vote, valuing signatures from the smaller counties more from any other county. Uh, we're not disparaging judges in any county. They, some, some judges can be found to do what they want in any county. So this isn't a comment about smaller counties, medium-sized counties, or larger counties, but the truth is if you have an 88 county signature requirement, uh, a lot of games are going to be played. All right, we have time for one more question, and gentlemen, please keep your answers short. Hi, Gene Krebs, president of the Ohio Association of Recovering Legislators. Mike, you missed the last meeting. Senator, we welcome your eventual joining the group. Um, my question is, most of the people in this room are able to have a nice house because they're able to go into debt for it. The reason the state of Ohio has many nice things is because they were able to go into debt for them roads, bridges, things of this nature. How will this issue, one, affect the ability of the state to incur debt for things that make Ohio a nicer place to live for its citizens and benefit our economic development? Well, thank you, and, and I may be there soon enough. Uh, so um, looking at uh, the issuance of debt, if you look at the historic election results for bond issuance, Generally speaking, they've all passed with over 60%. There's probably a few exceptions here and there. And to be honest with you, as somebody who has looked at the spending of state government um, and where it's gone, including our, our debt service payments um, and uh, the, the growth of state government, really, over the past eight years, even since I've been there, if the people of the state of Ohio decided that it's not good to issue debt, then it's probably not good to issue debt. 
Mike, keep it short. Again, you can go to the record book. Um, from 1955 through 2014, at 50% plus one, we've had 19 wins and 10 losses for a passage rate of bond issues of 65%. At 60%, we would have had 11 wins and 18 losses for about an average of 38%. It's incorrect to say that a 60% threshold has been easy to reach for a lot of bond issues. It would be debilitating for a lot of things, especially things like Third Frontier, which jump-started high-tech economic development in our state. All right, thank you. I wish we had more time, but I'm getting that hard rap from the back of the room, so I'll turn things over to Deb for concluding remarks. Well, I hope you all feel more informed by today's forum. Thank you so much to today's forum sponsor, the League of Women Voters of Central Ohio. And thank you to the Grange Insurance Audubon Center for its ongoing support. We are grateful to our virtual seat patrons and to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream. And our very special appreciation for today's speakers, I, I suspect this is not your last discussion like this for a public forum. Uh, thank you, Senator Rob McCauley. Thank you, Mike Curtin. And thank you to our host, Rodney Donegan. Please make plans today to attend next Wednesday's forum, CMC's annual State of Nonprofits, right here at the Grange Insurance Audubon Center. Please take a moment to answer our short survey that is in your forum flyers. We can't do this without you. We thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful afternoon.